Hello, and welcome to this special edition of History in Five Friday, presented by Simon & Schuster. Check them out at facebook.com slash historyinfive. We are uploading this episode for your listening pleasure on Friday, July 8th, in the lingering patriotic aftermath of Independence Day. We're joined by a familiar voice, Dean Carianis. Great to be with you again, Dean. This is fantastic. We managed to get together and talk about historical periods that we love, namely the Revolution and its aftermath, the founding generation. The Monday following the uploading of this episode is July 11th. We'll commemorate the death of one founding father, Alexander Hamilton, at the hands of another, Vice President Aaron Burr. Tragic, but definitely interesting. I look forward to hearing about it. Well, it's history, so you know there's going to be some deaths. It's kind of like opera. Everybody dies <laughs> in the end. True. No spoilers there. <laughs> you all know what's happening. <laughs> Yeah, don't tell me what happens at the end to Aaron Burr. Our guest for this episode is David O. Stewart. He's author of American Emperor, Aaron Burr's Challenge to Jefferson's America. You may recall our interview with Mr. Stewart on his latest book, Madison's Gift, Five Partnerships That Built America. Madison's Gift looks at the father of the Constitution's stellar career through the eyes of his key relationships, his wife Dolly, Thomas Jefferson, James Monroe, George Washington, and the man of the hour here and on Broadway, Alexander Hamilton. Go give a listen to Madison's Gift if you like this time period. If you think you might want to get to know him a little bit, that's a fun one. And you'll get a little bit more Alexander Hamilton in there, see what their relationship was like. DavidOStewart.com is the website. You can find more on his op-eds, on all of his writings, some more Hamilton-related musings there. He talks about, for instance, kids in his Maryland neighborhood are running around now reenacting the Hamilton musical. And isn't that great? It's such an example of Hamilton how art can provoke critical thought and curiosity about history. Otherwise, I mean, imagine putting ads for textbooks out about Alexander Hamilton, public service announcements, learn about Hamilton now, <laughs> but a musical, putting a story out there with catchy songs and all really captures people's imagination. Suddenly they want to know who was this larger than life character. When I heard it was coming out, this musical on Hamilton, I thought, well, every history person I know is going to go to it and not like <laughs> exactly. it. I asked Stephen Knott when he was on to talk about his book that he wrote with Tony Williams, Washington and Hamilton. Well, what did you think of it? And he said, well, he kind of went in there and sat down with his arms crossed. And by the end of it, he was just cheering, thought it was great. So you see something transcend genres like that. It's just for me anyway, I think like I own history sometimes, you know, you get really into one figure like James Madison and you say, well, you can't know anything about him. He's mine. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not the case. There's so many ways to look at them. Yeah. And looping back to James Madison, you have some news related to the fourth president, speaking of me having to share him with you and share him with David O. Stewart. So let us extend our congratulations to you. Thank you. Well, fellow history majors out there are probably familiar with the question, so what are you going to do with your history degree? Are you going to teach? They can't really imagine us doing anything else with it. And for <laughs> years, I've just said, maybe, but thought my mode of teaching the public would just be writing or new media like this show. But this year, I have been blessed to win a James Madison Memorial Fellowship, a scholarship to get my master's degree in history with a focus on constitutional studies and then teach the U.S. Constitution at the high school level. The foundation selects one student from each state to complete their master's within two years, and I'm the one from Alabama. Can't let James Madison down. Yes, exactly. <laughs> We're going to have David O. Stewart on. He is a constitutional lawyer, president of the Washington Independent Review of Books, not to mention a Madison enthusiast, somebody who, as he said, takes up for the guy when people kind of pick on him. Aaron Burr is the man of the hour right now, having shot the man of the hour, I guess you'd say, and Alexander Hamilton. So mm -hmm. let me just ask you, what do you think when you hear the name Aaron Burr before you pick up American Emperor? I think of the man who killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel, and sadly, I have to confess that not a whole lot else comes to mind. <laughs> well, that's something we are going to rectify right now. Here's my interview with David O. Stewart on American Emperor, Aaron Burr's challenge to Jefferson's America. <laughs> I'm joined on the line by David O. Stewart, author of American Emperor, Aaron Burr's Challenge to Jefferson's America. It's about the man who's infamous for killing Alexander Hamilton in a duel. Welcome back to the History Author Show, sir. 
Thanks so much for having me, Dean. I have been hearing a lot of Hamilton ever since the musical first came out from my wife, of all people, who's a Canadian citizen originally, recently naturalized to the U.S., and she has two music degrees, and I was amazed that she loved this so much. There's many people who love the play that you wouldn't think would love it, and now are learning more about the real history of Alexander Hamilton. He's more popular than at any time since the founding, maybe even more since then. Have you found readers coming to you now that maybe wouldn't have wanted to talk about American Emperor or Burr or any of the founders before, and they're saying, who is this guy? They cast him almost as a John Wilkes Booth. There's very much a surge in interest in the era and in Hamilton, and Burr is a beneficiary of that. The show, which I do think is a fabulous show, is very respectful of the history, tries very hard to get it right. There are some things they noodle with and wrench around a little, but nothing too terrible. And one of the things that the creator, Lin-Manuel Miranda, has recognized is that You can't have an interesting protagonist unless he has an interesting antagonist. (laughs) So he really delves quite deeply into who Aaron Burr really was. And I think it leaves people very curious about this figure who, as you say, has really been a sort of a, a neglected heavy in American history. I sometimes describe him as the second least admired American after Benedict Arnold, which is not a fair characterization of him. And I think it's great that people are interested in finding out more. He's a very complex character. I think that you would like to distill him down to just being the finger on the gun if you were doing a Hollywood movie. But you point out that the Hamilton musical isn't that. It really is good history. And I was blown away by that. I assumed that my wife was going to come back from it and tell me, no, it was bad. And they gave him a rocket or who knows, anachronisms and things like that. You wouldn't think that it would be for history-minded people who knew the real story. But He's somebody that is engaging. He's kind of a throwback to those classic villains in literature, somebody like Professor Moriarty, who can really match wits. And you describe Aaron Burr and American Emperor as kind of a mirror, a dark mirror to Hamilton. Yeah, they're often referred to as doppelgangers, which is sort of a way to (laughs) prevent people from understanding it. But (laughs) they were so similar in many ways. They were both sort of the same physical types, small and well-built, charismatic, incredibly bright. They were both great lawyers. They overlapped at the bar. They were both very enthusiastic about the opposite sex and engaged in many affairs. And they kept crossing paths with each other and pretty much getting in each other's way. There was a lot of respect between them, but there, over the years, built up considerable rivalry. Burr won his seat in the United States Senate by defeating Hamilton's father-in-law. That's never a positive in (laughs) building a relationship. And, you know, Hamilton developed a very negative attitude about Burr, and they really went at it a few times. Ironically, Burr tended not to say nasty things about Hamilton. Hamilton was quite open about saying very nasty things about Burr. If you're a good writer, I think that's a danger, especially in an era where everything is printed up and sent out in pamphlet form. You picture them coming across the Hudson when Simon & Schuster came to me and said, would you like to talk again to David O. Stewart about American Emperor? I thought about my ferry ride I used to take from Weehawken every day across to Manhattan and look up to where the Burr-Hamilton duel had been. It's Hamilton Avenue and John F. Kennedy Boulevard, appropriately enough there, where they have the Hamilton Park and they have a rock where they say is the death rock. They rested Hamilton's head before getting him back to New York, where he passes away in agony here from this mortal wound. It's something that seemed very alive to me here. And I was wondering if you would explain to people who maybe have taken that ferry or maybe look at that map of New York City, what brings these two men across the Hudson to this spot? Why the duel? It comes out of this long rivalry. In 1804, Hamilton's really become a creature of the past. His political career is basically over. His party, the Federalist Party, is anything but vibrant. Most of the Federalists dislike him. He very much hurt John Adams when Adams was the last Federalist president. And Burr has just, although he's vice president of the United States, is also heading towards oblivion politically. He was dropped from the ticket for the 1804 election. President Jefferson had never liked him. He ran for governor of New York, hoping to rebuild his fortunes, and he got beat. He got beat pretty badly. 
And while he was nursing his wounds from that defeat, he came upon a newspaper story about something Hamilton had said. Hamilton, as I said, often made nasty remarks about Burr, described him as unprincipled, untrustworthy, power mad. Burr was used to those. On this occasion, though, Hamilton referred to him as despicable, which was a term in the early 19th century that implied sexual perversion. This is, you can think of a parallel phrase today. This was not something Burr was of any mind to tolerate. He claims he had previously demanded twice that Hamilton retract things he had said about him, and Hamilton did, so he demanded it again. On this occasion, for whatever reason, Hamilton chose not to. They went back and forth, which was the standard when you were getting ready for a duel. It actually took him almost 20 days between the original demand for retraction and when they actually fought the duel. Burr remained very consistent, saying you must retract it or explain what you're saying or meet me on a field of honor, which is what they called the dueling ground. Hamilton just kept sort of dancing around the issue, not offering a retraction. And finally, there was no recourse but to go to the dueling ground. They went to Weehawken because dueling was illegal in New York, and it was also illegal in New Jersey, but it wasn't very well enforced there. It was a less well-populated state. Thought they could get away with it, so they slipped over there. But they end up, or Burr rather, ends up indicted by New York and New Jersey, right? He does. Shortly after Hamilton dies, within a matter of days, there's this huge outpouring of sympathy for Hamilton. One of the great ironies, of course, since nobody cared about him in the days before he died. He, as I said, had become something of a non-entity. And Burr ended up sort of heading out on the lam, sneaking out of New York in the middle of the night. And he was indicted in New York and then indicted in New Jersey. Now, the New York indictment was problematic at best, since that's not where the killing happened. But the New Jersey indictment obviously was more threatening. He never was actually brought to trial on any of those charges. And sadly, the legal record is not clear as to why not. That's a frustrating part whenever I read any historical book, and American Emperor is no different, a book of nonfiction as you read. They always task some buddy of theirs, go burn all my papers, and you want to <laughs> reach into the book and just say, will you stop that? Why are you doing that? I'm all for respecting people's last wishes. We, I think we discussed that before when we discussed Madison's gift about George Washington having all his papers burned, but especially somebody like Burr, you wonder. He could have left so much more. What did he leave compared to Hamilton as a historical record? Well, that's a great irony. Now, of course, just on the, <laughs> on, on getting rid of the indictments, he might not want that to have survived because it might not have been the most straightforward transaction. But he had a favorite phrase as a lawyer, which was things written remain, which he didn't mean as a good thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so he always left the least possible written records. And he left behind him some papers that fill two volumes. And before you think that's a lot, Hamilton, who lived 30 years less than Burr, which is, of course, not an accident, Hamilton leaves 35 volumes of papers. Washington leaves some 90 volumes of papers. So Burr left a very pale footprint in history on purpose. And this is something you've mentioned before, too, now with the play coming into such popularity. The words are what remain, and this is the message of the musical, really. And if you write things down, they will be remembered in this era. I always think that about the Adamses. If you were a person back then, they're going to get the final word on you because so many of them did burn all their papers. So you might want to just be a little nicer to the poor little guy because people picked on him so much, but he wrote everything. And John Quincy Adams wrote everything down. And that's one of the reasons I think if Burr wasn't such a compelling figure, we wouldn't know much about him maybe. But he had this whole other life or many other lives. American Emperor, this is an attractive title to me. It sort of sticks with you. It makes you look back at it again because it seems so against the nation that we've come to know. We just expect a republic. We expect democracy. I learned from reading the book that much of what I thought I knew about Burr's supposed secret plan and his conspiracy to split off Western territory for his own nation and attack Florida, maybe set himself up as emperor of Mexico. It really wasn't a secret conspiracy. This is very out in the open. And that was fascinating when I read it. Exactly. I made a point of never using the word conspiracy in the book because 
it couldn't have been more widely known. It was in the newspapers. <laughs> I know that's the amazing thing. And the twelve part series was it? Is yeah, no. There's a newspaper out in Kentucky that ran a twelve part series about Burr's scheme. They made up some of it, but some of it was true. And it was in the Philadelphia papers. It was reprinted around the country. People are writing letters to Jefferson for 18 months saying, God, you got to keep an eye on this guy, Burr. He's up to no good out here. He's trying to organize some sort of invasion of Mexico, of Florida. There couldn't have been less mystery about it. And we were such a large and sort of imperfectly knit together country then. Communication was slow. Connections were slow. That he really was able to make progress on his scheme. It wasn't a conspiracy, but it was a scheme, somewhat out from much scrutiny, but it was no secret. And Jefferson's attitude is not one of, oh my God, what is he doing? It's really, oh well, so if he breaks off almost (laughs) that attitude of some of the country, that would seem fine with him. It doesn't seem as if he's making any effort. It really is not until the end of, well, I guess that's why it's the end, but (laughs) it really takes him a long time. How does he eventually checkmate Burr? Well, he does seem kind of casual. One of the shocks to me in my research was discovering Jefferson writing things like, well, if the western parts of the country breaks off, that's okay. You know, it's just not that big a deal. Well, <laughs> they'll still be our children just like the eastern part will. And with Jefferson, you're never quite sure what he means, if he really means what he's saying. Sometimes he writes things for effect. But it's startling stuff, and there's no question that he either slept through much of Burr's scheming or he chose to ignore it on the theory that it was too ridiculous, which was a very dangerous theory. And at the final moment, this is in late 1806, he realizes that it is pretty serious and he starts moving against him and he issues some public statements. He does have the pleasure, and I think it was very acute pleasure for Jefferson, of basically having Burr set off on this expedition, which he did. And he tried to raise this in- invasion of Mexico and uh, New Orleans and possibly a breakaway nation, and kind of nobody showed up. (laughs) He ended up with about 110 people, which was a little short of what he needed. So at that point, Jefferson moves in, has him arrested and hauled back to Virginia and placed on trial for treason. This treason trial comes as the Republic is still very young. And you talk about in American Emperor how The framers set up the Constitution to make this a very hard charge to prove, they having just rebelled against their country and committed treason themselves against the crown. (laughs) Burr's trial is one of the trials of the century, and you do something in your writing, whether it's American Emperor or Madison's Gift, where you'll always slip in a little bit of dry wit that I really like. It keeps me going, and you say how this was the trial of the century, you know, the one we have every about five, six times a century in America. But this was a really compelling one with real world impact. Absolutely. I mean, Burr was looking at the gallows. Had he been convicted, he would have been hanged. And it was an amazing confrontation. You've got a former vice president of the United States. It's slightly more salacious that he also killed the former secretary of the treasury in a duel, accused of treason. You get the finest lawyers in the country. I mean, it's a complete dream team. We've all sort of been resensitized to the O.J. Simpson case in recent months. There were a couple of former attorneys general. There were an amazing number of great lawyers in the courtroom. And frankly, Burr was the best lawyer in the courtroom. And it was before Chief Justice John Marshall, who's the greatest judge in our history. So it was a remarkable aggregation of talent and very important issues were being litigated about the rights of the individual, about the powers of the presidency, and what sort of criminal jurisdiction there could be under the treason clause of the Constitution. Treason is the only crime defined in the Constitution. So this was a terribly important event. And it's the chief justice that presides over the trial? In this case, it's a funny thing. Jefferson very much took personal command of the prosecution. He was a lawyer himself, although he had never practiced a whole lot, at least not for many years. And he commits a couple of astonishing blunders. He very much wants Burr tried in Virginia because he figures politically Burr is poison in Virginia and that he'll get a great jury who will hate him. And that's true. But he neglects the fact that because under the system we had in place at the time, the chief justice had jurisdiction over Virginia and the justices of the Supreme Court did what was called then writing circuit. They would go out and hear federal cases in trials. 
Chief Justice John Marshall was, in fact, an enemy to Jefferson and exactly the judge Jefferson didn't want presiding over the case. So it's a funny failure in pursuit of one goal, getting the case before the jury wanted. He ended up with the judge he didn't want, which turned out, frankly, to be a more important failure. Burr, by the way, becomes vice president due to the laws of the time where he ends up tying Jefferson and he decides he's going to try to wrest the presidency away from him, loses, and the loser would end up number two, second most electoral votes. The idea of the vice president shooting somebody, it popped into my head to ask you, how long was it after former Vice President Cheney shot Harry Whittington accidentally before your phone rang and or you started getting that first email? And when did those stop when people started making the connection between the two? Well, the connection's pretty unavoidable. I always like to say that Burr was the f- only vice president to actually shoot someone while in office, at least for a couple of hundred years, he was the only one. <laughs> But he was aiming at the guy he shot at. Uh, in, in Cheney's case, it, it, we're told it was an accident. It is a striking parallel. Of course, they are very different settings. And, you know, I think Vice President Cheney was mortified by his situation. Burr ended up, I think, with a lot of regrets about the duel with Hamilton, but he absolutely was aiming at the guy. And when he's acquitted in his trial, you write in American Emperor that it helps cement the union. How is that so? Well, a couple of terribly important things come out of the legal side of the trial. One is, and Chief Justice John Marshall does this, he basically says it doesn't matter that everybody hates Burr. And there was a lot of people who despised Burr at this point because of the Hamilton duel, because of the accusation of treason. He's still entitled to all the protections that our Constitution provides for somebody who's accused of a crime. And that's a terribly important message that we have to learn as a nation over and over. And the first time we learned it, I think, was with the Burr trial. And you have the president of the United States, the most important, powerful man in the country, moving heaven and earth to get this man convicted. Dozens of witnesses were hauled into Richmond to testify. Every resource the government had to throw into the case was thrown in. And Marshall was not impressed. He did not allow himself to be pushed around. Second thing was the definition of treason. You mentioned that we were skeptical of treason prosecutions because we thought the British had always abused that form of proceeding. So the Constitution makes it hard to bring a treason case. You have to have two witnesses. There are only two ways you commit treason, which is by giving aid and comfort to an enemy or by raising arms against the United States. And Marshall enforced those very tightly and concluded that the prosecution could not meet those standards. There's also an issue of executive privilege, which comes up every now and then. Listeners recall the Watergate situation and many since. When there's a fight between the branches of government, the president often asserts executive privilege, saying that he doesn't have to release certain documents because doing so would risk the national interest. Jefferson tried to assert executive privilege during the Burr case. Burr very much wanted to get into Jefferson's papers. And Chief Justice Marshall ruled that he might be the president, but he wasn't the king. And he could assert a privilege, but it was up to the court to decide whether it was asserted correctly. That's been the law for over 200 years since, and again, a very important piece of our law. A final point, let me say quickly, is by losing, by failing, the one thing Burr did do was he had really invited the nation to break up, to have parts of it secede. And by failing, he made secession less appealing. Now, of course, we would continue to flirt with it through the Civil War. That was a pretty serious flirtation. You even still hear about it. A couple of years ago, the governor of Texas was talking about it. But I think the first time there was a semi-serious conversation about it was the Burr conspiracy, and it failed. And I think that actually had an important impact of causing people to think, okay, this country's here to stay. My guest is David O. Stewart president of the Washington Independent Review of Books and author of American Emperor, Aaron Burr's Challenge to Jefferson's America. You can visit him at davidostewart.com, that's Stewart with a W, and find some great reads at washingtonindependentreviewofbooks.com. Library Journal writes of the book we're talking about today, American Emperor, quote, 
Stewart's sympathetic but unapologetic study of the enigmatic Burr transcends its subject in exposing the frailty of America's westward ambitions, unquote. The word sympathetic there jumped out at me. Do you think it's a fair assessment of American Emperor? And are you running into more people now who would prefer that you really stick it to Burr? They don't want to like the guy or hear that he's a good lawyer. Well, I always try to be fair. (laughs) This is what I think most writers will say. I don't want to hide the ball. I don't want to conceal evidence of historical figures, good or bad acts. You know, if you're writing about a slaveholder, you got to talk about it. For example, Burr was for a short time a slaveholder at a very small level. So I don't know that I think of it as sympathetic. I think it seems sympathetic compared to what some people say about Burr. I do find that people are very curious about Burr now and not so much that they want me to stick it to him. I think they really are curious about the guy from the show. The musical really does show Burr as a human being who had a a loving marriage, who had ambitions, who had frustrations, and who had a point of view. And I think people now want to sort of see what more there is to know about Burr. There's another precedent from his treason trial that I wanted to mention, and that's habeas corpus, which is something we hear about often in trials. This is also a legacy of Burr's and his masterful defense here, isn't it? It was. It came up in a couple of contexts in related cases. Several of Burr's friends were also prosecuted, seized and arrested. And again, it was Chief Justice Marshall who ruled that even though the claim was that there was a traitorous conspiracy at work, that the fate of the Republic hung in the balance, the habeas corpus provision, which is one that says you can't be thrown in jail without having charges brought against you, that you must know what you are accused of. Everybody's entitled to that. He said that applies to people who are accused of trying to overthrow the country too. There are no exceptions. And that's a terribly important thing. When we went through the Guantanamo litigation and it went on for years, all of the cases started first with Chief Justice Marshall's opinion in the Burr case. That must have really burned Jefferson to be compared to so many of these things that the kings were doing, you know, to say, well, okay, you can't just throw someone in jail because you say that they're opposed to you and never tell them why in sort of this American version of a Kafka play. You have to actually tell them. And it's kind of Latin, I guess, maybe makes people's eyes gloss over a little bit. But if you're the one that's in prison, you want a chance to have your day in court. And it's something that we owe even the most villainous figure here. And you think, okay, I can see it when you read American Emperor. You, I can see why they really wanted to stick it to him at the time anyway, if not people today maybe. But the fact that he is able to still employ his legal mind, these are all things that we use today. You see this sort of big wheel of the Constitution still rolling. It is a fascinating set of principles that come out of this, what has to be described as sort of a train wreck in Burr's life. Yeah, I do think Jefferson had the satisfaction of seeing Burr's political life ruined, but legally he basically never laid a glove on him. You talked about his personal life there a little bit, his wife you mentioned. We also meet in American Emperor his daughter, Theodosia. Describe their relationship, how it ends, and the role she may have played in sparking the infamous duel. Well, Theodosia was a daughter he cherished greatly. His wife died. She was considerably older than he, and she died of cancer rather tragically when he was only 37. So he was a widower, a single gentleman for 30 years or 40 years. He doted on Theodosia. She was an incredibly bright young woman. He had her raised and educated in a way that women were not in that era. He had a high view of women's talents, thought it was ridiculous that they were not given the opportunities men were for education, for advancement. And when Hamilton accuses Burr of being despicable, and this is completely a speculation, I I need to flag it. Uh, It was first made by the novelist Gore Vidal, and he flagged it as a speculation. But I think it's a persuasive one, to be honest, that Burr may well have understood that to have been an implication that he was sleeping with his daughter, with whom he was known to have an extraordinarily close relationship. And nothing would have infuriated him more than that kind of allegation. She comes to a very tragic end when Burr is finally acquitted of the criminal charges for the treason. He goes overseas. He frankly tries to persuade the British or the French to 
underwrite him to lead an expedition into Mexico to liberate South America from the Spanish yoke. He didn't actually meet Napoleon, but we know that Napoleon thought about supporting Burr for at least 10 minutes. <laughs> a guy who worked for him brought it to him, and he did seem to think about it a little bit and then decided against it. Ultimately, though, Burr finally figures out a way to sneak back into the country. In the interim, his only grandson, Theodosia's son, has died of a fever, very tragically, which breaks him up terribly. He gets to New York. And he immediately sends for Theodosia to come join him, even though she's married. She has been ill. She seems to have the same cancer that her mother did, some sort of uterine cancer, most likely. And she gets on a boat in South Carolina where she lived with her husband, who was then governor, with an escort. And the ship sets sail and it's lost at sea. And Burr haunts the waterfront in Manhattan for two or three months hoping every morning that Theodosia's ship will show up, and it never did. Like you said, tragic. Tragic end, not to know. Yeah, I think it's terrible. It's not nice to have a body, but at least you have a funeral and some closure. So you have to feel for him on that. It was a very difficult thing. You know, there have been lots of people arguing that, you know, she landed with pirates. She was seized by pirates, and people have written novels about her life as a pirate wife, but they're all, in my judgment, pretty silly. They had to sail past Cape Hatteras the end of December and early January, which is a dangerous time. There was a storm. It's very likely that the ship went down. And you mentioned Gore Vidal, and you mentioned some rumors here about Burr. There's one that's in his book about Burr being the father of Martin Van Buren. Kind of a fascinating one, but it's not so, huh? No, it really isn't. Van Buren's parents are well-established, and it, it wasn't Aaron Burr. They knew each other in Burr's older years. You know, Burr, when he returns to this country, he lives another 25 years practicing law in New York. He's kind of a scandalous figure, but he's also a fascinating figure. There's a wonderful recollection of him by William Henry Seward, who became Secretary of State during the Civil War for Abraham Lincoln. Seward was a young lawyer when he ran across Burr in a case he was handling, and he writes about him quite breathlessly. I mean, here is the hand that pulled the trigger that shot Alexander Hamilton, and, you know, I shook that hand, and, you know, Burr would retell stories of Washington and Jefferson and all the people he had known. So he was very much a figure. He actually schemed for his former son-in-law to become a candidate for president when James Monroe ran, although that didn't work. He never could quite escape the notoriety of his his career, but he never gave up. He was a resilient fellow. That's the next thing I wanted to ask you about. I always try to encourage people to apply history to their own lives. You'd think after shooting Hamilton, being tried for treason, not to mention just all the personal losses, you'd probably just want to go crawl in a hole somewhere and spend the next 25 years maybe writing your memoirs or maybe just sitting there getting drunk, as Franklin Pierce famously said when he left the White House, had a lot of personal tragedy too, and was a failure. Nobody wanted him around anymore. Instead, Byrd does what you said. He gets his law license back. He practices into his 70s, which is a very old age when you think about it back then. What do you think people can learn about how to be resilient from reading American Emperor? Well, he is a guy who has, and it has to be said, self-confidence bordering on delusion. (laughs) (laughs) And he does not give up. And that is one of the traits of a successful person. He ended up with enough reverses in his life that he could not achieve anywhere near what he hoped to achieve. But, you know, he was never a guy who was going to go bury his head. He had spent time with the great leaders of the nation and measured himself against them, and he thought he measured up just fine. (laughs) And so he was not shy about that. He continued to try to wield the influence he could and to achieve what he could. Now, one of the things as an old man that he did, which was quite remarkable, uh, it's a bit out of character for his reputation, is he tended to take in orphans and raise them. If it happened today, people would accuse you of sexual misconduct, no doubt, but he really did sponsor these young people. There were two young girls who grew to adulthood, and he placed them in good marriages. 
two young men. One was set up as a novelist. The other went to West Point or got him into West Point. He became a sponsor for hard luck cases. He kept trying to make a difference in the world. He seems like he had a lot of energy and it really is an inspiring story when you think about coming from somebody who could have been a rival to Benedict Arnold, as you write, for the title of most despised American. He'd been with Arnold, in fact, on the expedition up to Quebec, but he doesn't want to accept that. And you say if he was convicted, we would have maybe gotten rid of the name Aaron, too, as we did with Benedict and Arnold in the U.S. You know, we scraped that off of all the stones and things, Benedict Arnold's name. They really knew how to hold grudges back then, and with good reason in these cases. But he could have been president. He wanted to be president. Predicting a given person's success as chief is probably as fun, I guess, as it is impossible to do. We never know based on a resume or what have you. But with that said, indulge me anyway and tell us, had Burr won the presidency that he so sought, how do you think we'd be looking back at him today from 2016? Well, I tend to annoy people by insisting that Burr would have been a pretty good president, in my judgment. He had very middle-of-the-road views politically. He drove Hamilton wild because he would often not take a position if he could avoid it. But when he did have to take a position, it tended to be quite centrist, quite consistent with the views of most of the people in the country. And he was a very effective and good administrative mind. I think when you had to worry about Aaron Burr was when he didn't have power. That was when he sometimes would fall fit to bad judgment. When he did have power, people were always somewhat surprised at how well he behaved. There's a wonderful sequence after the Hamilton duel. He's under indictment in two states. He's been on the run for several months. And he's still vice president, so he comes back to Washington and resumes his duties as vice president, light as they were. But one of them is presiding over an impeachment trial in the United States Senate. That's what the vice president did was to preside over the U.S. Senate. Still is a duty, although rarely exercised these days. Um, and many people were scandalized at the sight of this accused murderer presiding over an impeachment trial. And then within a couple of weeks, these people who hate Burr are all saying, well, he's actually doing a pretty good job. He's very fair. And I think when you allowed Burr to have influence, to have power, he behaved quite well. It's when he couldn't get a seat at the table that you had to watch out for him. He seemed to have always been trying to get to the inside and have a job. I guess it's the idle hands being devil's playthings was the case a little bit when I read American Emperor. Well, one of the songs that is written for him in the musical, which I think is one of the many, several brilliant songs in the musical, is... I want to be in the room where it happens. And I think it very much captures Burr's great frustration in his career was he was not very often in the room where it happened. And he certainly did want to be there. Picturing George C. Scott as General Patton standing there in the movie and he's saying, it's the biggest war. It's what I've trained my whole life for. And they've got me on a shelf and he's just dying to get in there. And I don't know if you'd think that's a fair comparison, but that's kind of how I picture him. Just wanting to get in and use his talents and be able to make a difference. Very much. Burr thought he would, I mean, he, he was sure he would make an excellent president. <laughs> <laughs> and it frustrated him no end that he really was never going to be, and he, and he knew it. One last question, a parting shot, if you will, with all due respect to Mr. Hamilton, about that fatal bullet, which we will mark the 212th anniversary of or commemorate the 212th year this coming Monday after we air this episode, July 11th. All eyes are going to be on Hamilton. He's the victim. He's the one with his name on the marquee on Broadway. But how would you like us to remember Aaron Burr on that date, beyond being the one with his finger on the trigger, beyond being the one who tried to set himself up as an American emperor? Well, about the duel, I would really like people to understand that the way I see it, Burr behaved perfectly properly under the rules of the time. And it was really Hamilton who was the fellow who acted oddly. He said the outrageous thing. He refused to renege, and then he really set Burr up by saying he wouldn't fire at him. We don't actually know if he did shoot at Burr or not. There were only a couple of eyewitnesses who survived, three of them. Two of them said Hamilton shot at him, and one said he didn't. And so we don't know the answer to that. But Burr's presumed crime there, I 
to me, he was following the mores of the time. They were ridiculous mores, but he was. And I can't fault his conduct there. He is in many ways, though, a case of misspent potential. He had great talents and he was not able to achieve what he'd hoped to. And that's how I would remember Burr. Kind of a sad case in our history, kind of an astonishing case for the things he dared to try and someone we should not forget. Well, David O. Stewart, after reading American Emperor, I will not forget Aaron Burr, and I will remember him this Monday, along with Alexander Hamilton. Really is an amazing figure, a compelling figure. Thank you for joining us on this special History in Five Friday edition of the History Author Show. Aaron Burr, who's enjoying renewed attention these days, locked forever in the story of Hamilton. But hear both sides of the story. Go seek out the book if you're interested in history and if you enjoyed the musical, which whether you love history or whether you just love music, people seem to be falling all over it. So best of luck with American Emperor. Thanks so much. The book again is American Emperor. Aaron Burr's challenge to Jefferson's America. Now I want to find out what happened to Theodosia. <laughs> oh, there's one of those unsolved history mysteries. It's something. Yeah. What, what a character in Aaron Burr. Somebody that we tend to only associate with that one incident, the duel against Alexander Hamilton. But there's so much more to that. He was a political mover and shaker himself, though never quite the center stage that he even intended. It's interesting to speculate on all sorts of things in history. You mentioned his daughter going down in the ship, you know, and I think, well, they must have been able to find the ship. And then you remember it's 200 years ago and it, you know, it's long gone and broken up against the rocks. Likely there's no clues to be found. Exactly. And you wonder yeah. all these what ifs, you know, what if Aaron Burr hadn't won that election defeating Hamilton's father-in-law? And- yeah. What if he had stepped aside and let Jefferson have the presidency? And what would Jefferson's reaction have been then? What would have happened eight years from then? Maybe he's the one he chooses to succeed him instead of James Madison. Unlikely, but at least there wouldn't have been that incredible animosity and he wouldn't have looked like somebody who was trying to jump out of his station there to achieve something that he hadn't earned. And so I just think he's so driven by that. It makes for fascinating reading for sure. Yes, it really does. Where should listeners go to pick up a copy of American Emperor? They should go to the Amazon link at historyauthor.com and always click through the banner on our homepage for all their Amazon.com purchases. They toss us a few continentals for every purchase, and it doesn't cost the good folks who listen anything extra. Did the conversation with David O. Stewart make you want to go out and pick up American Emperor if you hadn't already read it? Absolutely. I really like what David O. Stewart has done with this story, showing us a character in America's past who has an interesting subplot of his own. Learning more about such characters helps us better understand the players, too. Just look at how many more dimensions we're seeing of Thomas Jefferson these days. I thought that was a pretty interesting moment and when he's trying to decide where a case should be held and yeah. inadvertently <laughs> makes a choice that doesn't play out in his favor. Not a great lawyer at that moment. <laughs> and you would have thought we'd know all about Jefferson by now. One of the first people you might think of when you think of a founding father. We call them characters, and I don't mean to pick on you having said it, but it's a reminder they're flesh and blood people. Exactly. We've done a lot of these books that try to bring out those new things that you think would be impossible to find. Agony and Eloquence by Daniel Malik. He said he was shocked to find that Jefferson was conspiring against Adams with the French ambassador, the French attache. He couldn't believe it. He said it's really, he didn't want to use the word treason, but it really was shocking that he went to those lengths. And it does make you look at him with less esteem, but you know, that's the real guy. So let's get the real picture. It's not going to be a character like in a Bond movie or a novel. That's true. And especially if we start pining for, oh, the good old days when everyone was unified and believed the same thing. Oh, it wasn't like that at all. (laughs) We look at someone like George Washington as the father of his country. How could anybody oppose him? But I noticed in Stephen Knott and Tony Williams, Washington and Hamilton book, Jefferson was even afraid of Washington becoming a tyrant. 
There's also a video going around imagining a campaign ad from election 1800. And you see all of the things these candidates were saying against each other then. Yeah, yeah John Adams. <laughs> that was my all-time favorite negative attack. Thomas Jefferson's dead. What? It's, 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 what a rumor to start. Well, you know, hey, it's, it's, you might think I'm awful, but, you know, I do have one thing Jefferson doesn't, that I'm not dead. I'm alive. Here I am, John Adams. They really thought that one was going to stick. But And then you read here in Aaron Burr, an American emperor, you read that he here he's looking at everybody, all these guys in the room, and going, "I can do that job better. I can be better than this Monroe guy. What an you know empty suit. I can do better than him." And he's clearly looking at them all and saying, "I can do that job." And I can do it better. And he believes in himself to the point where he thinks he can just split off part of the country and make his own. Like, heck with you guys. I'm going to go get my own game and start it and have my own country. You won't let me run this one. <laughs> it's just an amazing tale and so much more than just a finger on a trigger. One other thing I wanted to mention, too, is David O. Stewart has a previous book, The Summer of 1787, The Men Who Invented the Constitution. In addition to all your work here on the History Author Show and your Madison Scholarship, you were so in love with that year that you decided, hey, I want to do my own film on time traveling to 1787. Why travel to 1787? Why not do a project on 1776? Everybody knows that era. There are songs and fife and drums. Well, I could talk for hours about all the years I really would like to time travel to. And I really, in my dreams, if this could all work out, I would want that short film to turn into a series doing just that. Just another unique way of having encounters with history that people are not as familiar with. David O. Stewart's 1787 book highlights certain characters, and that and one of those characters that is often forgotten about is George Mason, and that's somebody I wanted to feature in this short film. But yeah, this was one of my crazy ideas of trying to blend art and history and maybe find a way to create good educational resources that I can use once I'm teaching constitutional history. And we are looking forward to that 212th anniversary of the Burr-Hamilton duel on July 11th, the Monday after we're airing this episode. I wanted to point people who may be in the New York, New Jersey area to the annual gathering at the Hamilton Memorial overlooking the Weehawken Dueling Grounds, the spot I mentioned when I was chatting with Mr. Stewart. The Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society will commemorate the fatal event at 6 p.m. Eastern Time with the theme for 2016 of celebrating the new generation of U.S. currency. Folks, I have to say, when I first saw this news, I felt really out of the loop because I know the Alexander Hamilton Society, but there's an Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society. You were not aware of them, so <laughs> now we're creating awareness. Yes, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas Hamilton, fifth great-grandson of Alexander Hamilton, will speak at the Hamilton Memorial Bust a year after his call to action to keep Alexander Hamilton on the $10 bill. And as a total history nerd moment, I was already preserving some $10 bills in case <laughs> Hamilton was removed from it. That's a good way to save money. <laughs> Collect them all. The event will reflect on the collective and individual efforts that contributed to the preservation of Alexander Hamilton's place of honor on the next generation of U.S. currency. Now, we're here to talk about American Emperor. We're here to talk about Burr and Hamilton. But I am going to complain of my history nerd moment as another aside here and say they threw the major, President William McKinley, off the $10 bill in 1929 to put Hamilton on it. And I still have not quite reconciled myself to the president's <laughs> replacement. Of course, they were both shot and they both died. You're always replacing somebody, I guess. And I thought maybe I'd ask if you want to join my faction, Amanda, to try to get McKinley. Maybe he could be on the other side of Hamilton on the 10 I, I didn't realize McKinley was originally on the $10 bill. What if they put him on now? Some bill that we don't carry around anymore? Yeah, he's on the 500 Okay. Yeah, 1929, they took him off and they put Hamilton on it. So That's odd. I, you would have thought it would be the other way around. but No, nope, that's hmm. just how it goes, yeah. Okay, that's probably about all the Hamilton anyone could want for this commemoration weekend. We'll link to your Facebook page at historyauthor.com link to that and i'll be sure to give william mckinley <laughs> full credit in an episode at some point i'm glad you're joining my faction <laughs> this is really fun 
to do this a little bit of a different way. I'm glad people are listening. And I want to thank David O. Stewart and thank you, Amanda, for joining me today. And I'm glad we got to meet Aaron Burr. (laughs) Have at it, Madison Scholar. Do our tag. That's it for this special History in Five Friday episode presented by Simon & Schuster. I hope you'll join us for this Monday's interview, Classical Wisdom Wednesday, and next week's installment of History in Five Friday. And remember, if you subscribe to us on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. Until our next trip into the past together, thank you for spending some time with us. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.